Hello, I'm Josephine Burton and welcome back to the Dash Arts podcast, seeing the world through an artistic lens. We're in the thick of a series exploring identity and specifically what happens to identity during moments of national crisis or mass change across Europe. And this episode is all about empire. We'll look at how the slow decline, collapse and ongoing aftershocks of empires affected the identity of its citizens across Europe. To kick us off, I reached out to journalist and writer Satnam Sanghera, who just recently published a book, Empire Land, How Modern Britain is Shaped by Its Imperial Past. Let's start with me asking you about the book. Tell me about Empire Land and what led you to write it. Well, I knew nothing about empire and I was probably in my early 40s when I realised I knew nothing. And it was, I was sent by Channel 4 to make a documentary about John and Wallabarg, which is a famous massacre that happened about 100 years ago in India. If you've watched Gandhi the film, you've seen it depicted on the silver screen. It was a massive event, one of the events that arguably ended empire. But when I got there and found out about it, I realised I knew very little about empire. And the man on the street in India knew lots and given everything about me could be explained by empire the reason i'm here as a british asian is because some british people invaded india in the 18th century you know the sikhs i'm sikh um their identity was largely created by the british you know they they fetishized us they told us we were a warrior race which is the way we see ourselves now so so many things about us about me could be explained by empire and yet I knew very little about British Empire, so uh, I thought I'd write a book about it. And actually, it turns out that everyone else feels the same. They don't know enough about this thing. And yet, it's arguably the biggest thing we ever did as a country. You know, the fact that we conquered a quarter of the planet. And yet, we don't teach it, and we don't really think about it. Thank you. Perfectly encapsulated. <laughs> um, and what was, the, what was the journey that you went on? Was there a sort of historical research perspective on it? Or were you talking to people? Was it a bit of everything? Um, it was chaotic because I'm not a historian. I did, I did English at university. Uh, I'm a journalist. So I was more interested in how empire has shaped us in Britain rather than looking at how it shaped the world. This kind of question that I'm posing about that foundation shaking nature of, of, of like suddenly being denied an identity or the identity disappearing overnight, having an you know having a tremendous impact on people's lives. Is that an experience that you that you sort of discovered as you started to talk to people? I think it's a, it's a struggle I've had in my whole life. If you're British Asian, you know, it's the you know the clash of West and East. But actually, this book was really interesting because. It involved going way back into British history and, you know, encountering some really dark things, genocides, massacres. And quite a few people often ask me, you know, did it make you hate the British? If anything, it confirmed my sense of Britishness. It made me feel even more British than ever because it, it told me that, taught me that the connection between Britain and India and the Sikhs in particular was profound and it goes back centuries. It's a deep connection. And I grew up with a narrative, I think we all grew up with a narrative in this country that brown people kind of came here in the late 60s and took advantage of British hospitality. And, you know, I grew up with a narrative that we could be thrown out at any point. My parents always had suitcases on their cupboards. They, they didn't want to get a British passport. But to learn that actually you know brown people came here as citizens that actually you know the 1948 nationality act made citizens of empire citizens of britain made me realize actually there was a more profound connection there that actually we came on equal terms the people who came on the windrush didn't come as immigrants they came as citizens they came to see the mother country you know they were entitled to come here and um i didn't realize that i think as a country we don't realize that which is why we could have the Windrush scandal, where British citizens could be deported to a country that wasn't their home, you know, because we have such a poor understanding of why brown people are here. It wasn't that their identity had changed, it was just the perceptions of their identity had shifted. Yeah, no, there was very, actually there was very little preparation in Britain for the Windrush in that I don't think Britain knew they were coming. I don't think. I also don't think the British knew what they had done with the Nationality Act because, basically, with that act, they made six hundred million citizens of empire citizens of Britain. You know, 
many, many times the population of Britain were allowed suddenly to come into Britain. And there's complicated reason for why they did that. One reason was that they were trying to hold on to empire. They're trying to turn the Commonwealth into a version of empire, not thinking through that lots of people would want to come here and um, not wanting to introduce a colour bar. But then, you know, all the legislation that followed was an attempt to undo that. It's a totally baffling figure. 600 million more citizens of Britain. No wonder the UK faced an identity crisis. I spoke to one of the UK's leading black music experts and cultural commentators, Lloyd Bradley, about its impact on identity and how it affected music in Britain. Would you actually even say there was an identity shift that happened as people landed in and made their homes in, in the UK? Um, no, there wasn't a shift at that point. I mean, people that arrived in the 40s and 50s were... First of all, most people didn't imagine they were going to stay here, so they were... Jamaican or they were Nigerian or they were Sierra Leonean or they were Barbadian and they really I'd say the majority of people planned to go home um, the economic migrants uh, planned well I'm going to earn a load of money and then go home and live well and so many came to go to university and this was a thing that happened a bit later with independences especially in uh, West Africa where people would come to London to do a law degree or a medicine degree or an accountancy course or something and then go home and take their newly acquired knowledge back to enrich the new nation that uh, had been formed. So there wasn't an identity shift because people didn't have a long-term goal here. But people did choose to settle. Why, do you have a sense of what happened that, that changed, those, changed, changed things for people? chose to settle makes it sound too much like a positive it just sort of happened you know uh you have a plan to come here for five years for instance i mean then a lot of people would meet their um, husbands or wives here and end up having children here and it it was a gradual process i wouldn't have said it was all uh, right i'm going to settle here now you know it's like oh uh, well, actually, it's more convenient to stay here than to go home. And even then, people still thought, OK, well, I'll let the children grow up. They can go to school here. Once they're settled, I'm going back. And there's an awful lot of people went back to Africa, went back to the Caribbean um, in their 50s and 60s after their children had settled. I mean, you know, I can talk to people of my parents' generation and... Um, they say, oh, I just looked round and I'd suddenly I realised I've been here 30 years. My mother-in-law, for instance, is, oh, she's in her late 80s now. And her life is in London now. She's been in London for over 60 years. Where was she born? What country was she born in? St Kitts. Do you think if you were to ask her in very simplistic terms, like, you know, to explain her identity you know, from those days when she first arrived and those days now, do you think the emphasis of her identity would have shifted? No, it wouldn't. She's, she is still Ketitian and she sees herself as Ketitian. The identity shift largely happened because of what a melting pot London was. You've got to remember, to the host nation, all of us were the same, essentially. You know, um, your average white English person wasn't going to bother to differentiate between a Jamaican and a Ghanaian. You know, we were all black people to them. And so we realised we had much more in common than we did keeping us apart because of the way the host nation viewed us. So many people settled amongst um, people from wherever they came from. You know, there are pockets of different uh, islands or different countries all over London. So you might get, you know, two Jamaicans would get married. Their children would identify as Jamaican. However, their children now you're talking about the second generation born in London, they were meeting all sorts of people. They are starting now to identify themselves as Londoners. Would you say that very gentle change through the generations, would you see that mirrored in the music evolution of black British music through the 20th, late 20th century? Definitely. Um, the, way it, the way things occurred in London, quite simply, because as far back as the 40s, um, you had 
jazz players from all over the Commonwealth. It's back to this thing. Um, the host nation looked on pretty much everybody as the same. So therefore, black musicians were black musicians. And uh, people got to know each other because club owners, they'd put on a band. And as long as they were all black players, they could advertise them as anything. If they wanted a rumba band, then this lot were from Cuba. If they, they wanted a, a jazz band, then the same people would be advertised as straight from Harlem. So there's always been a huge element of DIY culture in this. And this allowed um, the music, the culture, the art forms to flourish away from what the mainstream felt they ought to be. Lloyd told a story of integration and slow blurring of identity, sometimes resisted and other times imposed by the host culture as non-white communities were othered by the mainstream. I asked Satnam about his own family's move to the UK. My family came in the late 60s from India and, uh, you know, they came to do the jobs that there weren't enough people to do. And this is, I guess this is a bit better understood. You know, Britain had a massive labour shortage after the war and there were all sorts of jobs that weren't being done. So the foundry jobs in the black country, and my all my uncles and my father and my grandfather did. My grandfather worked in a foundry until his mid-70s doing heavy labour. You know, but these were jobs that British people didn't want to do or there weren't enough to do. And, you know, immigration is one of the reasons why the NHS could be established, you know, and uh, it's why, it's partly why 44% of the NHS now is BAME, you know, the medical staff. And, you know, the, one of my favourite statistics is that, you know, in two, I think 2003, in the Rhondda Valley in Wales, three quarters of the GPs were Asian. These immigrant communities helped rebuild Britain after the war. They helped build the NHS and they helped you know, us beat COVID in the last year. But I still think there's very little awareness of that. It totally is. After independence in 48, your family, presumably, did they feel Indian? Did they always feel British? I'm just interested in that kind of tension that was going on. My grandfather used to talk in a vague way about how talented the British were in that they, you know, they turned the Punjab into a very productive part of India agriculturally. But if they, if they saw themselves as anything, they saw themselves as... Punjabi and Sikh, you know, because like Sikh, Sikhs are quite a small community with the exact same size as the Jewish community, actually. And um, when you're small, your identity matters to you even more. You know, you hold on to it. And it's what they held on to when they came over to Britain. And actually, people forget that, you know, my, my family came to Wolverhampton and the local MP there was Enoch Powell. And his Rivers of Blood speech, very famous speech, was about Sikhs. It was about how Sikhs in Wolverhampton were refusing to integrate and how this was going to destroy Britain. And I sort of see where he's coming from in that there was a lot of resistance to integration then in the Sikh community. But now we're considered one, a model immigrant community. It's interesting how the, Britain has changed its view of brown people. Because I remember in the 90s, black and Asian people were grouped together. Actually, in the 80s, you know, all brown people were called black. I remember that phase. I remember when BBC, the BBC started running, I think, a comedy programme called The Real McCoy, which featured black and Asian comedians together, like they were the same. And then we started having separate black shows and Asian shows, so things like Goodness Gracious Me. People started understanding the difference between black people and Indians. And now I think the country is quite sophisticated in that I think most people understand the difference between a Hindu, a Sikh and a Muslim. I would say most people do. But at the same time, you know, my sense of identity is it gets more and more specific. I mean, that I used to see myself as Indian and then it was British Indian, then it was British Sikh. I probably call myself British Sikh, but I spend more of my time nowadays trying to make clear I'm from Wolverhampton rather than London because I feel really drawn to the Midlands. And But then sometimes I feel like the easiest thing to say is that I'm a Londoner because that shuts down all conversation. Sometimes you just don't want, don't want to talk about it because it's so complicated. But then now I lived in America and people just didn't know what Sikhs were. And when they saw you, they'd sometimes think you were Mexican or something. So then I was very English. You know, then it was my accent. 
that made me stick out. So it changes a lot. It changes over time and it changes according to geography. And did the um, did the book change you, do you think? The writing of the book, the exploration of empire? It's the most toxic subject because basically when you're talking about British Empire, you're talking about race. You're talking about white people conquering brown people. And you've got millions of people in this country who are the descendants of the colonised and have very strong feelings about empire. And you have millions of people who are descendants of of the colonizers who have very strong feelings and we've got a massive culture war going on mainly at the between the right wing of the conservative party and everyone else who sympathizes with black lives matter and I, I i found myself right in the middle of it i mean when i started writing the book it was quite an esoteric subject and people didn't really know what i was going to what i was talking about and but then black lives matter happened and all the statue stuff and suddenly the entire world is questioning how we've been shaped by colonialism until now the story of empire has only been told by white men of a certain age getting off trains on bbc2 at 6 30 p.m and uh when suddenly you have brown people people like me and david yoli soka telling the story it really threatens people's sense of identity and britishness because they, it, we're disrupting the hierarchy of empire and we're disrupting the hierarchy of the way the in, imperial story is normally told. And we're saying, you know what, empire wasn't necessarily good. So people find that deeply triggering, but some British people do. And so there's been a load of hate mail. Um, and interestingly, you know, there's white historians who, I mean, William Dalrymple does very similar stuff to me. And he was asked by The Guardian whether he ever got any of the hate mail that I get and he said he'd not got one a single letter in 30 years and which says it all anarchy yeah the anarchy book that's very interesting oh that's so sad yeah he gets Hindu nationalists but he doesn't get British people complaining to him and that's I think it just it's because I'm brown you know are you um do you have enough support are there people who read your read your social media for you so you don't have to be confronted by it social media is a problem but it's also, I mean, social media until now has really been a positive thing in my life. I've made so many friends from it and it's changed my life for the better. So I'm also addicted. So, <laughs> Have you chatted to other people from other kind of nations like France or Spain or Portugal and Holland that are dealing with, I guess, the legacy of their own colonial history? Are there similar things that you've come across that are going on in other parts of Western Europe? You know, we have massive nostalgia for empire here. And a, a survey came out recently, which showed actually the Dutch have even more nostalgia for their empire. I mean, we're second, but then the French, the Germans also have quite a lot of nostalgia for their empire. So we're not alone. And actually the Sikhs had an empire, massive nostalgia amongst the Sikhs for empire. But also the culture war, which I've referred to, you know, over empire between the Tories and Black Lives Matter, that is happening around the world. It happened in, in America with Trump trying to introduce a patriotic education, you know, which didn't go anywhere. It's happening in Hungary and Poland, and it's happening in India where Hindu nationalists have got their favored historians and you know are, and hate other historians actually they hate William Dalrymple for one you know because they don't it doesn't fit their Hindu nationalist view of the world so it's quite it's a common thing around the world I'm realizing as I'm talking to you which is I, I love these how these always moments happen when I have these podcast conversations is that the big identity tr kind of foundation struggle that happened the other side of it has been the kind of foundation shaking that's happened to indigenous British people yeah. who have had to relook at themselves. That's been the massive change, hasn't it, from the collapse of empire? Yeah, I would say this is the biggest thing, one of the biggest things in the world is that finally these people, I guess, you know, white men are having to face up to certain things and they don't like it. So there's a massive backlash, you know, and... Uh, you can see in the right wing of the Conservative Party. I mean, I think you can be conservative or Labour and, and believe in what I believe about empire very easily. But for some conservatives, given the Conservative Party has always been the political party of the ruling classes who feel intrinsically defensive of empire. You know, it threatens their, not only their identity, it threatens their power. You know, because if you, uh, if basically you recognize that brown people are here for authentic reasons that they are equals then you've got to give up your power and your privilege you know and hence massive backlash you know you could see this whole culture war as kind of this dyspeptic burp 
amongst a certain demographic you know who just don't like the way things are going so they complain about the taking of the knee they complain about colonialism being taught at school you know but i think they're on a hiding to nothing because stuff is changing regardless I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. It's taken so long for these former empires to, to fully understand, fully come to terms with the impact of the end of the empire. It wasn't an overnight reaction. No, and Britain's had, I think, one of the reasons we are so dysfunctional about our history is that it all happened abroad, you know. And unlike the French, you had to look in the mirror and have a dark night of the soul after World War Two. You know, or Australia, that had to confront what it did to the Aborigine, Aboriginal um, people in in Australia, even America, where they had slavery in their own nation. We've never had to face up to what we did. It's that line that we have. It's the "we're here before we, we are." We're here because you were there. Line, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. The the thing that's finally forced the Britain to face up to its imperial past is is the fact that there's so many of the colonized here now. And, you know, it's, it's, they're finally going through the experience of decolonization now. And it's so long after the formal end of empire. The ending of empire has affected the whole world. It isn't just the British that are still dealing with its aftermath. I spent some of this summer working with the musician Samira Bramia on a new project for Dash Arts. During rehearsal breaks, Samira told me about her own family history. Samira was born in France whilst her Algerian parents were studying there before returning with her to Algeria. She talked of the difficulties faced after the civil war in Algeria, a country struggling to find its own identity. I was born in France because my, my father didn't, uh, was finishing his studies of, of, uh, to be a doctor. But he decided to uh, come back to Algeria to build the country because uh, it's, it was a generation of people who wanted the, the f freedom. Algeria needed uh, all, all, um, all the Algerians were supposed to, to come back to Algeria to build the country. We had a, a big problems, big problems between two sides. The, the people who wanted to build Algeria with its history, with French people, with the French people who were okay with the independence of Algeria. And there was another part of Algeria Algerians who wanted to impose Arabic and uh, the only real religion, Islam, and uh, do not have any contact with the Occident. And my father wasn't thinking like this. So in the 70s, we could build a very nice country with the, the French who were supporting the independence of Algeria. We could, we could really build a very nice country, a very big country, a very interesting country and very open-minded country. But it wasn't the case, unfortunately. And they imposed like one thought, one, one, one political party, one one way of uh, of thinking it was like that and, and no way to to find another solution and and when did you go back to france in the 19s and uh, there was uh, like civil war in algeria and I, I couldn't stay in france because i was my mind was there at the end of the 2002 i was there for a festival and i saw what uh, how they were welcoming me, they were, they, they, they were treating me very well and there was no difference between me and very famous artists. So I called my father and I say, OK, Daddy, I will stay. For you, this sort of this absolute French Algerian identity that you have, how has it been over the last 20 years of living in France? I think that it's a very nice place for opportunity, but it's not the only one. I think that we grew up with the idea that the only country we can go because of the language is France. And uh, it was easier and not very far from Algiers. I had to build because in Algeria, I wasn't French. I was really Algerian and I, I still I am still Algerian. And I like the expression um, that said one, one, one film director who's I think Algerian, I don't know. She said, why everybody is asking me and we answer, uh, are you French or Algerian, half and half? And she said, I'm 100% French and 100% Algerian. For me, it's the best way, it's the best answer because when I came in France, I was French, but people did not consider me as French. They always asked me until now, 
from where I am to to sing in Arabic. Why I don't have Derbuka in my team. Enfin, it's very, very hard and very pleasing too to build my own nationality. I mean, it's so strong, Samira. What you're saying is so powerful. Uh, do, do, you, do you think this is the legacy of empire? That the people who come from the old colonies, they consider themselves to be, you know, French. But the French still have this history, still live with this history that they were, you know, of the empire. There's a lack of acceptance on the part of the host country to acknowledge fully that you are French. You know, I, I don't know if it's just specific to uh, the French Algerian history, but I think that uh, until now it's very hard to talk about Algeria and for the French people. Very hard. I don't know if you heard about it, but um, a very famous uh, historian who's named Benjamin Stora, uh, he, he wrote, he, uh, the president asked him to make like uh, a research about, uh, about the, the history and about the war. And, and it was like in France, it was like an event and he had a lot of um, problems because of it. We can't talk in France about, uh, for, about the Algerian French history because it's very hard because uh, both sides know, uh, there are some secrets and some problems and it's not yet solved. So it's still raw. It's still so recent and still so raw. And are you saying there are still secrets that have not yet been revealed? It really will take time. I performed in, in, in a project whose name Barbes Café, which was talking about the Algerian musical history in Paris. And uh, we were talking about the colony and the independence war in France, how French people helped the Algerian. We performed like a big place like Théâtre du Gymnase in Marseille. And every time in the show there, there were a, a moment uh, talking about the independence and we we talk about it and there is a song talking about independence every night there were like 20 people going out because they couldn't uh, couldn't accept this part of the history. Samira draws attention to just how incredibly difficult a topic colonialization is still all over the world. The wounds are still open and it remains so difficult to acknowledge and try to heal them. I asked Satnam why he thought it has taken us so long to confront our own legacy. Well, not only did empire happen abroad, but also I think it's complicated history. You know, it's much easier to think about World War II very short history, clear beginning, beginning, clear end. To think about 500 years of history that covered a quarter of the planet that was complicated, contradictory, isn't talked very well at all, and, you know, isn't written about, isn't the stuff of films, you know, it's, it's very easy to ignore it, you know, it's very easy to ignore it. Also, it's very painful, you know, it's very hard to face up to the fact that you're responsible for massacres a genocide in Tasmania, you know, the death of millions in famines across India. And it's much easier, again, to think of World War II, where we won, where we beat the evil racist Germans. Do we need like, mass therapy as a nation? How do we move on? Young people are very animated about colonialism, very animated. they desperate to be educated. They're not getting it massively from the classroom. So there's huge numbers of Instagram accounts that go into history. They, they talk about it. There's films like Black Panther which address it. They really care. And businesses care because they want young customers. So they jumped on the bandwagon, you could say, you know, and I just don't think you can resist it. You can resist the pressure. And I think you've seen with the taking the knee thing, the way this culture war is going to go, because, you know, we had a bunch of conservative ministers trying to disparage taking the knee with the footballers. And it just didn't work out because they had the England team, the England manager, you know, even the press, which frankly is quite right wing and young people against them. And I just feel that this is the way the world is going. We're getting more and more progressive. And, you know, within a, within a few decades, within a decade, I think, you know, Britain could be 30, 40 percent ethnic. And you can't fight that. Yeah, I think the I think the I think the recent story with Tyrone Minks, it was amazing what he did, what he said, and the fact there was a kind of a universal acknowledgement that he of course was right. And that was just that felt so exciting. And even Gareth Safegate's letter felt exciting. It gave me some more optimism about us moving beyond this crisis, certainly. Yeah, I mean, they've lost the argument. 
the Conservatives, in the space of two weeks, they have lost the argument. And actually, I find taking the knee, I think it's getting more and more powerful as a gesture because it really reveals a lot about the the people who react to it. it says a lot. And I, I was at the game at Wembley on Sunday. I found it really actually quite moving to see the Italian team and the referee taking the knee. It's a very quiet gesture and it's so short, but it says a lot, man. And I think it's amazing and it's growing in power. And it's, you know, today we're seeing GB News is falling apart because one of his presenters took the knee and it's just brilliant. And um, yeah, I, it's quite an exciting time. I spoke to Satnam in the days after the UK lost the final in the Euro 2020s and the media was full of taking the knee, defaced murals and missed penalties. The winds of change were in the air. I asked Lloyd whether he could see change in the world of music, specifically how the melting pot of cultures and nationalities in Britain through the 60s and 70s have shaped music today. I'm really interested to understand the influences of that, the, of that time on black British music today. Can you, can you say a little bit more about where you see these sort of strains have continued? After I finished writing Sounds Like London and I could look at the narrative as a whole, as opposed from... Uh, delving into concentrating on little bits of it at a time, I realised that the biggest characters in kind of modern black music um, in London, post-jazz black music in London, Kitchener, uh, Eddie Grant, uh, Jazzy B and Dizzy Rascal, you know, in uh, a chronological order. And when I looked at them properly, I realised they were all exactly the same person, probably about the same age when they hit big, but they were people that had the core of something and managed to bring their environment into it. They, they connected with both their environment and their cultural core and created something that spread completely beyond the initial market if you like you know oh we should put Dennis Bovell in there as well in between Eddie Grant and Jazzy B and created something that was like reggae or like soul or like hip-hop but absorbed their environment their influences and came up with something completely unique that connected with a London audience on a really kind of quite almost personal level. This is what's going on around me on the streets in the world in London and I'm putting that into music. I'm not trying to recreate a Caribbean music or an American music or an African music and impose it on um, an audience. I'm going to take on board what the audience already knows, what they already appreciate and they're going to tell me um, more stuff and I'm going to add that to this kind of bubbling pot that I've got that is um, soul to soul is the equals is lovers rock reggae it is jungle is grime you know it's it was all the idea of taking a core of something and instead of trying to force it upon your listeners or your audience saying well Actually, I know you kind of like this, but you kind of like other stuff as well. So let's put it all together. And that is a, a thread that has run through it probably since the Southern Syncopated Orchestra in 1919. I love that idea, Lloyd, because it's just such a beautiful way of understanding a complex and ever-evolving identity that is immediately represented in some way through the music that the artists have created. The identity was moving along that way by the time we arrive at grime in uh you know the early 21st century you've got something that is almost completely invented it's not say like jungle which had a core of dance or reggae or um jazzy which uh soul soul which had a kind of core of hip-hop or dennis's lover's rock which had a core of reggae grime sort of almost started itself and it, it just kind of went to show that um, the connections with wherever their grandparents might come from, because we're not talking about parents now, because of the mix-up of what black kids and their heritages have become, you know, the, the way people have mixed up, suddenly it's like, actually, we need to create something completely new here. It's almost a, a subconscious thing. People would deny that they've lost their identity or their heritage and they haven't lost it but 
at the same time, almost without realising it, there's a, a new thing being opened up. I love Lloyd's idea that music can help create a whole new identity and act as a creative outlet for a sense of displacement. It led me back to Samira and how her music navigates the political and cultural links between France and Algeria. How does the this tension uh, play out musically? Is there great nostalgia for sort of French Algerian songs? How would you understand all of this politics through music? The representant uh, of this uh, generation is Enrico Macias, of course. He pr represents really a certain... Um, time in Algeria that still is in the minds of the, these people. You know, I will tell you a story. Once I've been, I was like preparing a show and I've been to a store. The man was Jewish from Algeria. And as I told him, you know, I'm, I'm from Algeria. Oh, yes. And uh, my friend, she said, oh, you know, she's singing Lili Bonish. Lili Bonish is very famous. It's very Jewish, Algerian. And the man, I she, he, he asked me, oh, can you sing for me I sang you know I had everything freak <laughs> for me it was it was a little bit funny but disturbing so the repertoire that you choose when you do your gigs is it is it is it inspired by this by this sort of I guess your kind of greater political dream of what Algeria could have been is it do you do you curate a repertoire for your concerts that bring up bring out the Berber songs as well I guess not just the Jewish songs or but the whole world the French songs in Algeria for me, it's not like a, an artistic direction. I, didn't, I did not decide to talk about it. It's only that when I'm trying to write something, there is a relation with my history. Because when we lived the, the 10 years of civil war, thanks to God, we had a lot of humor. We made, we made jokes, even if we were dying. And this is very important for me to, to say that we stood, we never gave up because we have and we still have and we had this hope. My identity is really is this. I want to be more human and less French and less Algerian, more human. Because if we have this identity of human and empathy, we can save someone not because he's like me or he has the same color of skin, because he's a human. And this is important. Samira's gorgeous sentiment concludes this episode. Throughout our time together earlier in the summer, Samira was swept up in an immense campaign to galvanise the French Algerian community to purchase oxygen ventilators for Algeria, where the country is battling a particularly difficult Covid wave. She is a truly beautiful human. She recorded a version of Lily Bonish's nostalgic Algier Algier to play our podcast out. My huge thanks to Samira, to Satnam and Lloyd for sharing their thoughts and music. Next time on the Dash Arts podcast, we continue our journey through the 20th century, turning our gaze on former Yugoslavia and its fragmentation into seven countries and how its collapse impacted the lives and artistic work of its citizens. You can subscribe to our podcast via our website or wherever you get your podcasts to ensure you don't miss it. And if you like the Dash Arts podcast, follow the show and share and please leave us a review. It helps us stay visible and would mean the world to us. The Dash Arts podcast was produced by Rachel Head. I'm Josephine Burton and we'll be back in a fortnight with more conversations. Thank you for listening. <laughs> قلبي plein de tristesse mais il ne sait qu'en revanche où es-tu place du gouvernement J'aime toutes les villes un peu plus Paris Les une magie comme l'Algérie Comme elle est belle Ou un hab hab le belle fait un coup, man, 
شحال شحال جي شحال نحبها كومون فولي فو انا منحبها دون سون سا كبر و يما و بابا de son soleil je ne puis me passer depuis mon enfance ne tri dans ces rues sans me lasser Un peu plus Paris me comme l'Algérie Comme elle est belle On a pas de belle fait un coup Je l'aime, je